I'm Nathaniel, this is Stefan. I'll be doing the talking. He's here to look pretty. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and yeah, we're going to tell you about how we design a new default color map for Matplotlib, which we hope they will pick up, and how you can too. Um, so, um, color maps color maps are great because if you have data, you just look at it and it doesn't make any sense. It's just a bunch of. I'm sorry, you're not here? Okay. Color maps are great because data doesn't make any sense when you just look at it, but if you take each of those values, map them to some corresponding color, and suddenly you can see the structure that's in your data. Color maps are there. You need color maps because they're an interface between your data and your brain, basically, right? But not all color maps are created equal. Um, so for instance, this is everyone's favorite color map they love to hate, JET. Um, it's famous for how it distorts your data. <laughs> I won't go into all the long literature about this, but uh, one study I particularly like, or if that's the word, um, is these people did um, some user studies on a tool for uh, diagnosing uh, heart disease by looking at imaging of cells. So these are doctors looking at patient data, and of course the default in the tool they actually use every day is JET, because it's the default color map. Um, and so that's what they're practiced at. That's what, if you ask them which color map they want to use, they say, oh yeah, that one, we like it, it's colorful and stuff. But if you measure their behavior, compared to these better color maps over here, they take twice as long and they make more diagnostic errors. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> like it's a joke, but like it's, it, I don't know, it may have killed people, right? Like <laughs> the defaults matter, right? So, so, okay, not yet, but then you have the problem of what you do instead. Um, one sort of obvious thing that might come to mind is this color map called Perula. So MapLab, after inflicting JET on us, finally switched away itself, like last year, to this one. Um, it has a funny sort of name. It's because it's named after a bird. It's a scientific name. And it's a lot better than JET. It's pretty good. Uh, however, we can't use it because they worked really hard on it, so you can't have it. So never mind that. <laughs> Um, I'm sure it's not very good anyway, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we have to make a better one and finest open source project. Fine, we'll do it ourselves. How hard can it be? Coincidentally, this slide also explains why it took me seven years to get my PhD. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so what do we want our new color map? What, kind of, what are we looking for? So, well, we know it should be colorful. It's right in the name, right? Um, and probably pretty, because if people don't like it, they won't use it. Um, we don't know anything about our data in a default case, except that it's like it's numbers, so it should probably just be sequential, not like diverging or circular, or any sort of fancier ones that assume structure about the data. And then, of course, the key problem with JET is we want our new color map to be one that actually re accurately represents the data. Like if there's a certain change in the values, that should look like that when it hits our brain, right? Be nice for a default in particular if it also works in black and white, because people do still print things. Um, and because we are, you know, decent human beings, we want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. So this is sort of a starting set of criteria. How are we going to do this? These ones down here are tricky because they sort of are, involve sort of technical color theory issues. So let me t teach you color theory. The talk is even shorter than I thought. But um, so this is just the basics, but it's actually not that complicated. I think people have a lot of, like, misconceptions and sort of fuzz confusion around how color works, in my experience. So forget all that, we'll just do it straight from, up from the basics. We're scientists, right? So from the start, what happens when you display something on screen? So you have some data, you put it through color map, you get RGB values, that's a signal that goes to the monitor. The monitor spits out some photons. This is what photons look like, according to Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> the photons hit your eye, in particular the sensor at the back, the retina, which can create some electrochemical sim symbol. Yeah. Signal, she goes to your brain, and then that somehow gets turned into subjective perception by a process involving lightning. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need to understand how this process works so we can make sure the data gets to the brain in the correct fashion. Uh, the place to start is up here. There's this really nice simplification due to how light works on the retina. Here's the key idea. So a lot of people think light, like a photon, has a wavelength. It's just like a number associated with it. But that's not how light is, because light is a mixture of lots of photons. So I mean, sure, something like my laser pointer here is, out of all the different wavelengths, it's just a bunch of light of a single wavelength. 
But most light sources are, you can think of like these vectors of many, many different uh, wavelengths and how, much, how many photons there are at each one. So very high dimensional kind of thing. And then in the eye, there's these three different sensor cell types uh, called long, medium, short, one, two, three, whatever. Um, and basically what happens is the light hits the eye, you take, this is like a matrix, you take the, you know, do dot, and you get a three-dimensional signal going to the brain, right? And so this is, so, is really nice because it's linear. So we understand how linear algebra works, right? Um, we have this high-dimensional space, it's getting projected by a linear option down to, operation down to a three-dimensional space, so you know there's this high-dimensional null space of stuff that's getting collapsed away. That means there's a lot, for every possible signal, there's many, many possible light sources that generate it, but we don't have to care, we don't have to keep track of those. As long as we know that two different light sources produce the same signal over here, that's all you need to know. So that's sort of the foundation of you know, color management in general, is it's called the CIE XYZ space, which is picking a nice basis for that three-dimensional space. So each point in this three-dimensional space represents an equivalence class of spectra. So right here in this visualization, I have the three uh, coordinate axes. You're sort of looking straight down at the origin. And you think, you can't have, it's not the case that every single point in the space corresponds to any spectra, because you can't have spectra with negative amounts of photons at a particular wavelength. So in the high-dimensional space, you restrict to the positive quadrant, and that gets projected down to a certain kind, like a cone in this space, right? Any, along any given line, you can either have all the points or none of them, and there's sort of a funny shape. So that cone is coming straight out towards us to sort of get a sense of what it looks like. I'm gonna take a slice through it at the, the simplex, the x plus y equals z equals, x plus y plus z equals one. And on that slice, it looks like this. You've probably seen this kind of image before if you spend any time with color. Like, that's what it is, that's where it came from. So how does this work? So for example, here is the spectra of this laser pointer I'm using right now. And it turns out it, you project that through, it lands right there. If I have a red laser pointer, a spectra like this, it comes over here. And this space has, this is sort of arbitrary, we just picked a nice basis that sort of makes it, basically they picked a basis that made the shape fill up that triangle. It's, it's arbitrary, the space is what matters, not the exact way it's skewed. But the fact that it's linear is very important. Because so, suppose we want to know, here's another spectra we can make, like by mixing together two laser pointers. Where is that gonna end up? Well, that's a linear combination of these two spectra, right? And so if you, and linear combinations are preserved under linear projections, and so it should end up somewhere on the line between these two projected points. And in fact, it does. You get yellow if you put together a green and a red laser. This is the key to understanding why it's shaped like this, right? Is because these kind of laser-like spectra, obviously you can make any kind of spectrum out of mixing a bunch of them together. So the space of all possible uh, points in this space is the convex hull of those laser-like points. This also tells us how monitors work, sort of the key point for that. So yeah, that's what light actually looks like. <laughs> we understand how monitors work, but actually what this means is we don't need to know for a monitor what the actual spectra coming out are. We can just jump straight there. We just need to know for each, when we you know, send a predictive signal, signal to the monitor, which point in that three-dimensional space do we end up at. So all we really need to know, for each pixel in a monitor, it's basically got three little light bulbs in it, you can think of it. You turn them on more or less strongly, so you mix them together. And what we, all we need to know is what are those three points? We're gonna take a linear combination of them in XYZ space, and we need to know if we send a particular signal to the monitor, how, how, much, how many photons come out of each one. So for a standard monitor, these are where the three points are located, so that's the space of colors you can actually make. And this is the curve for if you send 10, it sends out you know, that many photons. It's not linear because that's how cathode ray tubes work and we now emulate cathode ray tubes and software. <laughs> um, so, but this, so it's pretty simple, right? We're, we're doing pretty well here. We just need to add this one little piece here. No big deal, right? So here's a... Um, a simplified wiring diagram of the visual system in the brain. Each of these little boxes represents a, a biological supercomputer. Um, we, don't, we don't try to model this. <laughs> Instead, we, you have some sort of, uh, um, just sort of you, basically you do curve fitting. You, you come up with some sort of good enough matches to all the different things, you, the particular sort of perceptual things you care about. Um, and so what, what is the kind of the space we're trying to figure out? One of the key things that's different about perceived light versus like light that hits your eye is that there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, light hitting your eye and what you end up seeing. A major cause of that is because your eye does some sort, you do sort of normalization. Like if it's bright out, then 
you know, something that's relatively bright shouldn't look too bright. If it's the middle of the night and you see a really bright light, it looks really bright. Called white spice normalization, which produces well-known problems, right? So if, if your brain thinks that there's a blue light here, this looks one thing. If your brain's thinking that there's a sort of yellowish light, it looks different, right? The actual dress in each of these two drawings is identical in terms of the pixels, right? It, just, it doesn't look the same because your eye is sort of doing different kinds of correction for the environment. And so what this means is we have that infinite cone in XYZ space, but that gets sort of, in any given scene, there's the brightest thing gets sort of chopped off and you get rescaled into this three-dimensional blob. It's the sort of space of perceived colors. So this is how we think about it. So top to bottom, it's like black to white, and then there's one axis that's blue to yellow and one that's red to green, right? There's a lot of different sort of computational models of how this works. A classic one many people are familiar with is CIE Lab, which is literally one line of Python. This is the dot operator coming in th Python 3.5. Um, so you can see it's, you know, you normalize the white point. There's a, bright, there's a nonlinearity in our perception of brightness that's in addition to the one wanders have, totally different. And then there's this change of basis thing. Um, this was very fancy in 1976. I assume people were doing this like on their desk calculators. Um, this is sort of the more modern version. It has four pages of equations, <laughs> which I will not try to go through. Um, so compare these. Lab is basically uh, designed to estimate similarity by distance. Um, and CKMO2 is not. <laughs> but CKMO2 is really excellent at things like, you know, all the, all the uh, colors along a single line and a few actually are the same color. That's not very true in lab. So what we're going to be using is this even newer space called CAMO2 UCS, which is just built, you start with CAMO2 and then you sort of transform it to make the distances work. So you keep, you keep this nice, you know, nice properties in terms of real, really high accuracy in other 30 years of development in the science, and you get an even better model of color distance as well. So that's that space you were looking at there. Okay, so now we know how all this works. We know how we can go from data, we can run all the way through and figure out what it will look like in the brain, at least for most people. What about people who have colorblind? I have to sort of skim through this. Basically, remember those four cell types in the eye? People who are colorblind, overwhelmingly what's going on is that there's something a little wonky about one of these two cells. So that the sensors either become more, have sort of, are even more similar to each other, or one is missing entirely. You notice they start out very, very similar. It's because we only picked up this middle one very recently in evolutionary time. Um, and so and it was made by taking a copy of this and tweaking it a little. But this also means it's easy for them to sort of get mixed up during cell replication. Anyway, it's really cool. The effect is that mostly the red-green signal is the difference between these two. So um, if you take someone who has one of these kinds of uh, anomalies, that space gets squished in or more or less along that axis. So, okay, now we can do this for everyone. And so we built a little tool. You can run it yourself to help us you know, visualize how color maps work. You see there's the color map itself, and here it is in 3D space. The little dots are equally spliced here, so you can see that it's not very uniform. Another way to visualize that is we've just taken like the derivative, basically. So a perceptually uniform color map is one where this line is flat. Jet is not perceptually uniform. And then down here you have uh, what it looks like to colorblind people, hopefully approximately, um, and for black and white printing and some examples. Right There it is, jet, it's terrible. Um, we can also look at like Perula, um, there's something interesting going on here. So you can see it's a lot better than JET, right? It's a little bit variable here. But notice that the axis there is that's 200. And over here, 200 is down here. So that's actually much more variable. You can see it isn't perfect at all, though. Like, there's definitely, once I saw this, you suddenly notice there's this weird band at the bottom, which once is seen cannot be unseen. It's even stronger on a monitor than on this screen. Um, what's going on here is the Perula they designed to be perfectly uniform in lab space. And it turns out, lab space is pretty good for distant colors, about equally good to what we're using. But for nearby colors, it's really terrible. <laughs> and that's the crucial thing for uniformity, is getting those nearby color estimates right. So, we can also do is, we're not restricted to just saying like, okay, here's a color map, how does it look? We can say, here's what we want it to look like, give me that color map. So we made it, so here's an example of how you can do that. Say you want to make a little circular color map. Say, well, okay, I want the same lightness at every point. And I want, then I'll draw a little circle in the other plane. And then I said, those are my coordinates. Please convert using our little library. There's like 100 years of color theory in that line of code. 
and you get these new things. So here's wind directions. You can see sort of where there's shear between two different... Anyway, it's fun. I need to move on. What about a default color map? Um, for our default color map, so we know to be colorblind friendly, we have to use blue-yellow as our main axis, not red-green. And to be grayscale friendly, we need to go from sort of dark to light. Uh, and that means that we want to go from dark blue to light yellow, because you try to go from dark yellow to light blue, it does, there, there's nothing there. It's just how the blob is shaped. So we're pretty constrained. Um, our main choice that's left is here, we're looking down on the blob from the top. We're trying to get from here to here. We could kind of go around that way, or we could kind of go around that way. Now, we thought, well, MATLAB went around that way, plus there's sort of more room to work on here, so it's just better to go this way. <laughs> yeah. We, we like go our own paths, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we made a little tool to do this. I am sorry, Stefan, I think we are cutting a little bit short the, uh, your demo portion here. So this is the tool. I know, but I, we're already out of time. Like, <laughs> um, so you, at the bottom, you can choose the, where to start and end in light sp lightness, brightness. And since that totally determines that axis, then you, can only, you only have to deal with the 2D top-down view over here. And you just draw these, drag these bezier points around to change this. You can also look at different slices to make sure you're staying in gamut. It's great. It takes like two minutes to design a new color map. That's terrible because we need a new default color map. <laughs> and if everyone can design a new color map in two minutes, you will never end up with a single color map because of the problem that if everyone has an opinion, then no, one, no decisions can be made. And here we are literally trying to decide what color to make the bike shed. <laughs> so our strategy, we made three. So that's enough people have an opinion, but not so many it gets out of control. And what we, we ran a survey on the map hub list. We learned that democracy is useless. At the same time, um, Eric Firing said, well, but why don't we put green in? And he said, okay, fine. He designed one, we tweaked a little. Um, and we learned that, in fact, we had left out a very important criterion, maybe the most important criterion in our initial list, that criterion being it has to have green in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't really care. I just want us to pick something and get rid of Jet. So let me present our proposal for Matplotlib's new color map. We're calling it Viridis. That's Latin for green. Of course, this is Python. It's because it's named after, it's really named after a snake. If you don't like snakes, you could pretend it's named after a bird, uh, fish. Or if you're in a context where MATLAB compatibility is very important, then it could also be named after a bird. <laughs> Compared to Perula, um, we have more brightness variation, less hue variation. Um, I like it better. <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to use it. <laughs> uh, and, it has, and it avoids sort of that annoying kink. It's a more fancy, sophisticated model. And so, where are we now? All of our color maps will be available in the next release, so please don't come and tell me, no, 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 you should have chosen the second one instead. Like, you can have it. We just need to pick a default. Um, if, if the, what? We need names. We'll give them names, it's fine. <laughs> there will be names. I just, we want to like get it finalized before we give names to things. Right? You can't name thing and then kill it. You know, it's, yeah. Um, <laughs> and if those four aren't enough, you can make your own. Just let's fix one too. Um, so you know, so here's what's going on. The plan is MATLAB, MATPOTLIB 2.0 is coming out in a few months. It will be exactly the same as the previous release, except with better styles. New color map, probably new other things too. If you have opinions, I can't imagine anyone here would have opinions, but if you have opinions, we'll have a BOF tomorrow at 1 p.m. to discuss how Matplotlib should change its defaults to make be better for everyone. Come and do that. Yes, thank you. Right on time.